and it is my pleasure to, to welcome Matt Coyle, who is a local director and screenwriter, and he's currently filming a film Potential Inertia in Well City, so it's all local, all Western music, Western Pennsylvania music, I should say, and uh, he is a clarion alum from the year 2000, huh? where, he, where he graduated with a degree in speech, communications, and theater, and so I think you will enjoy him very much, and please give a warm welcome to Matt. We have a, a trailer from the film uh, that I'm actually going to show you guys so you can kind of see what we're working with. My life is a complex intertwining of will, relations, and emotions. Or the lack of I'm thoughtful but selfish, polite but rude in certain ways. I am strong and weak. I'm sure the door to a better me opens to a blinding light on the other side, but I carry with me thousands of keys. Which one fits the lock? I have obsessions. Writing, my ex-fiance, alcohol, trying not to fall asleep because maybe I'll have this unexpected epiphany that never seems to come. I wanted to tell you about the night I decided to kill myself, and I wanted you to know who I am. All a person wants in this world is for someone to know who they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's just kind of a, a brief uh, look at some of the stuff we've been working on over the past, I guess, a year, uh, almost a year. We started shooting in, I think, July of 2012. Um, I just want to say good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Royal, and I am creative director of One Fish Films uh, in Oil City, Pennsylvania, and we are making the first ever narrative feature film shot entirely in Venango County. Um, I'm a, a produced playwright. I had a world uh, premiere of one of my plays called Jerry's Pub in Detroit uh, in 2011. I've worked with such stars as Rue McClanahan, Bob Levy, Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Bullington, yes. Seth Rogen, Mel Michelle, yes. Anne Hathaway, Yay. Brent Register, yes. Ryan Reynolds, and Ed Powers. <laughs> the professor, not the porn star. Uh, like uh, Brent said, I am a 2000 graduate of Clarion University. Now, I jest with the professor, I do, but they are stars in their own rights. They really are. I mean, I learned so much uh, from each and every one of them being here at Clarion. Uh, I was asked to come here today and give a guest lecture, but I don't really feel qualified to give lectures, so I'm going to give a talk, okay? Um, and I'm going to be reading it the entire time because A, I'm scared to death of public speaking, and B, I'm old and I forget things, and C, I'm old and I forget things. Um, so, as long as you guys, if one person can take something away from today, uh, if you know, they can walk away and they, they feel like, you know, I enjoyed that, that's kind of cool, then I'm going to be a happy guy. So how, how, I mean, how is it right now? You guys doing all right? You get out of class early? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Did, uh, did you guys come see Spike Lee last week? Yeah. Did you go see him? See, here's the thing. When I heard Spike Lee was going to be here a week before I was going to be here, I thought to myself, like, what? What the hell can I possibly tell these people that Spike Lee 
isn't going to tell them. Um, the only, only guidelines Brent gave me uh, to, for, for tonight was that it doesn't have to be two hours. It can be shorter than that. And uh, please don't swear a lot. <laughs> I come from the, uh, the Kevin Smith School of Conversation, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, have seen him speaking at the colleges. Uh, so I will do my best to hold off on any F-bombs, but I, I will, I swear again. Uh, in all seriousness now, uh, uh, I think I was asked to come to Clarion tonight and speak because I've been part of the Clarion community before. I've sat in the same classrooms as the students here, as you guys have. I've been taught by the same professors that you guys have. And uh, I don't think that Spike Lee can top me on that one at all. Um, whether it be composing music, writing a short story, making a film, or any other type of creative endeavor, the artistic mind is a very interesting thing. Just like the body's need to consume food and water, the heart to beat, the need for warmth, or the lungs to breathe, the artist has an involuntary need to create. A need for self-expression that goes beyond ordinary human needs, but is still just as ordinary to the artist as those needs that I've just mentioned. Now, in a sense, for an artist creating something, Creating something to leave behind, a legacy, I guess, if you will, is an artist's equivalent of giving birth or creating life. Something to carry on their name and something to be remembered for. The thing is, everybody has the ability to create. To some people it comes naturally, some need to develop and nurture that ability, but everybody has a story. And that's ultimately what great art does. It tells a story. And the story may not be complete. It may not, it may not be the end. It may be the beginning. It may be somewhere in the middle. But such is each of our lives. Now, we each have our own story to tell. And we should encourage everyone to explore their own story. Now, an artist's life is not easy by any means. I mean, do not, do not drop your finance major and just go and be an artist, you know, especially financially. Now, maybe right after high school, right after college, you get a job doing some stuff, you make enough money to support yourself, whatever, you might be able to create art for the rest of your life. But to be an artist from the get-go is a very, very difficult thing. But in the words of Kevin Smith, Remember, it costs nothing to encourage an artist. And the potential benefits are staggering. A pat on the back to an artist now could one day result in your favorite film, a cartoon that you love to get stoned to watching, or a song that saves your life. You discourage an artist, and you get nothing in return ever. Now, Dr. Terman brought his class. Where are you guys at? Can I see some hands? Okay, you scattered there. All right. I uh, specifically, I knew you guys were kind because I had talked to him. And so I specifically want to kind of gear some writing stuff towards you guys because you guys would be what? The advanced creative writing class? Yes, That's awesome. I had him for fiction. He's, he's an amazing, amazing teacher. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I consider myself a writer first and foremost, more than anything. And I mean, I know how frustrated and pissed I can get when I put a comma in the wrong spot. Uh, I can even imagine, you know, what people who can't spell are going through. I can't even imagine that. Uh, now, I grew up on stage, and I don't, like I said, I, I don't really like, like the stage anymore. So not really my thing, not my forte. I'm not comfortable in front of a live audience, like you guys, at all. Um, I think the self-esteem thing or feeling of, of inadequacy maybe that I've developed from, from failed relationships, honestly. I mean, it's strange somewhat, but it's amazing how your psyche can be damaged in different aspects when you feel like you've failed at something over and over again. And writing is a lot like that. You feel a lot of times like you failed at something over and over and over again. 
But there's something intimate about writing. There's something both solitary and intrinsically validating about writing. Especially when someone reads what you've written and actually likes it. Like that's the best feeling in the world. You've connected somehow to someone from something that came from here and you put it there. But what do you write about? What do you write about? Like that's a question that a lot of young writers, you know, they face that every day. What do you write about? The old cliche about writers is, uh, is that you write what you know. Well, that is 100% true. You do write what you know. A lot of young writers, I think, feel intimidated because they lack knowledge or experience. Now, uh, Dave Grohl, do you, know, you guys know Dave Grohl? Foo Fighters, Nirvana. He was the uh, keynote speaker this year at South by Southwest. And uh, I listened to his speech uh, live stream online. And he said something that really resonated with me as an artist. He said, there, there's no right or wrong. There's only your voice. There's no right or wrong. There's only your voice. Your voice, your story, is what you know. And just because you may have uh, less life experience, thank you, <clears throat> less life experience, less knowledge than somebody else, that doesn't make your voice any less important. At one time in his life, Ernest Hemingway had about as much life experience as a Catholic nun. Think about that. <laughs> <clears throat> now with that said, to be a better writer is to live, to experience, to know, to see things. If you don't understand something, do not be embarrassed about it. There's always going to be people more intelligent than you. There's always going to be people less intelligent than you. And it's always going to be in very, very different ways, in very, very dis different aspects of intelligence. If you don't understand something, simply just say, I don't understand, can you explain it to me? This is kind of just some advice for you guys. Never be embarrassed enough not to learn. I think that's one thing that I took away from my time here at Claring is, do not be afraid to learn about new things. We learn our entire lives. Now, with the rise of technology allowing everybody to put their two cents in, I'm getting amazingly annoyed with these people that are creating these do-it-yourself uh, video things online, these video series and stuff. Do you, if, I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of those. There's so many of them. Uh, recently, I came across one that was about quote-unquote, writing habits. It's basically a couple people sitting around telling you how you should write. Here's the thing. As a writer myself, I've come to the conclusion that one can only come to by writing and surrounding myself with writers. Everyone has different habits, different ways, different idiosyncrasies that work best for them. It may just be one of those things that helps reflect their personal writing style. Sure, you can set limits for yourself, like word count, pages per day, but make sure that you set them, not a couple of hacks in an internet video, but probably regurgitating some formulaic example of what five websites told them was a great amount to write in a day. Chances are they probably never actually written anything in their lives. In other words, all I'm saying is, is find a process that produces your best work. It may be completely different than anybody else's, but it'll be what will work for you. So, all right. <coughs> Excuse me. Show of hands. How many people have ever been married? 
A few of us, all right. Uh, how many people have ever had a child? Okay, a few of us. How many people here have backpacks from Europe? We got one, all right. <clears throat> How many people here have ever lost someone or something? Like your favorite scarf, your grandparent died, you broke up with someone, went through a divorce. Okay, now, hold your hands up, keep your hands up. Look around the room. It's like pretty much everybody in here. Everybody, everybody, everybody in here. Now, I am fascinated by loss. That's the one thing I feel is, a truly is truly universal to every person on the planet, regardless of the varying degrees of comprehension of what loss actually is. It's a theme that I think will never abandon my writing. My writing never abandons it. We ultimately leave this world by ourselves, alone, cheery, I know. But it's that understanding that forces me to examine why we have a tendency to clash, to drive each other away, to abandon and forget, and to fight with each other. When all we have is 80 years on this planet, if we're lucky. I write about it to understand how I deal with it myself, and how others ultimately do as well. So, I brought a short story tonight. Now, I'm going to preface this with something. Because my friend Chris, who is, where are you at, Chris? You up top? Okay. I read, this, I read through this earlier with him at the house, and it's a really personal story to me. And so I might have to take a lot of water pauses because I get really choked up when I, when I read it. And, and who actually writes something that makes themselves cry? Um, it's, <laughs> but I wanted to share some of my prose with you guys in a short story for, for, the, uh, for Phil's writing class. I may not look at you either, so it might make it a little bit easier. <clears throat> this is called The Journey Home. The first films that I can vividly remember seeing in the theater were movies such as Return of the Jedi, E.T. So uh, really my first true uh, cinematic experiences were at the hands of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Um, in high school I had access to my parents' VHS camcorder, showing my age there. <clears throat> Uh, and later a Super 8 film camera. And uh, my friends and I would like to uh, shoot little skits and things like that just for fun. Uh, nothing structured, nothing really edited. Um, it did be all like one continuous shot. I think we just like capturing images or seeing ourselves on television. I think it's pretty much what it was. Uh, it wasn't until uh, college uh, here at Clarion, uh, that I, I really began to feel an interest in filmmaking as a process. Uh, Clarion, though, at the time, didn't really have any type of film curriculum at all. Uh, but the English department uh, offered uh, a screenwriting course, a movie genres course, a movie studies course. I know Kevin Stemler's here. Where's he at? Another ex-professor right now. I'm so glad you came. This is awesome. Uh, things of that nature. And in taking these courses, though, uh, that was the first time that I'd ever actually shot anything semi-cohesive. Um, the first real movie set, like real movie set, that I was ever on was for the film Juana Man. Do you guys know that movie? Vivica <laughs> Fox, Miguel Nunez, she's the, uh, the male basketball player who gets kicked out of the professional men's league and dresses up like a chick and plays in the women's league. Okay, yeah, okay. 
that was uh, that was the first movie set that I was ever really on. Uh, I lived in North Carolina. It was the fall uh, after I graduated from Clarion. I mean, I was just a crowd extra in the basketball sequences, but it was the first real up close look for me at how movies were made. And I worked three days on that film, twelve hours a day, and I, I was I was just mesmerized. I just, it was so cool. I couldn't believe it. I, I could sit there for twelve hours, get paid a hundred bucks a day, plus I think over eight hours is, is your time and a half. Um, get fed three meals a day, and got to watch people make a movie. Every once in a while, you know, an assistant director would run up and be like, "Okay, guys, cheer!" And we'd have to cheer or whatever because the camera would be on us. But it was like the coolest thing ever. Um, a couple of years later, <clears throat> after having gone through uh, a divorce and moving back to Pennsylvania, I, uh, I was online on uh, Nancy Mosser Casting's website. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Nancy Mosser. She uh, owns casting. Uh, she's casting director and owns a company out in Pittsburgh. I figured that uh, any flicks that were shot in Pittsburgh, uh, maybe I could just be a part of them for fun. Why not? So I was online, and I was on the website, and I filled out an online profile, and I swear to you, not 10 minutes later, I got a phone call asking me if I wanted to play one of Ryan Reynolds' friends in Adventureland. Uh, the scene was ultimately cut from the flick, but you can, uh, you can actually see me headbanging to the foreigner cover band in one of the bar scenes. And uh, it was cool because I actually got to meet Ryan Reynolds and hang out with Ryan Reynolds, who's just, he's funny in real life, and he's, he's actually much, much cooler than you would imagine. Um, but on set, I got to know my friend Katie, who, uh, who worked for Nancy Mosser. She's actually, Katie is now one of the casting directors down there in Pittsburgh for Nancy Mosser Casting. Um, since meeting Katie, I've gotten to be on set for Zach and Mary McPorno, which was so just surreal to me because I grew up a Kevin Smith fan and to see him like walking two feet in front of me was just, it was mind boggling to me. Um, meeting his wife, Jen, uh, Jay Muse, Seth Rogen, Justin Long, and it was just, it was, I, I was probably more starstruck on that set than when I was on Love and Other Drugs with Jake Joan Hall and Anne Hathaway, which was totally, totally a blast. Uh, because we all, everybody ate in the same area. So like the extras and the stars were right, just everybody ate together. It was pretty cool. Um, but I think it was amazing to sit there two feet away from Academy Award winner uh, Ed Zwick uh, directing his actors. Just seeing that process was, was, was amazing. Um, the great thing about being subjected to people who are great at what they do is the fact that it makes you better too. So as artists, I encourage people to try and surround themselves with those, those like-minded to them who are good at their craft because it will push you and it will encourage you to expect more from yourself. For example, your professors. Also, don't be afraid to actually put yourself out there because you can always get that phone call 10 minutes later. Now, in 2011 and 2012, I produced, directed, shot, and acted in a web series called Monster. Yeah. Well, I guess I edited it, too. It screened at the 2012 Los Angeles Web Series Festival, LA Web Fest. They're in their, like, their fourth, fourth year this year. They just had it uh, this year. Um, it went on to win Outstanding Achievement in Cinematography in a Mockumentary Series, which was the last thing that I thought it would have gotten recognized for at all um, uh, in, 2000, in, in 2012. Uh, but it also provided me my first opportunity to visit L.A. for the first time since I was 12 years old. Now, Monster, like most of my work, is once again a product of dealing with loss. I'd just gone through a breakup, felt I needed to find a way to express how I was feeling. And the only way that I know how to do that is to create. Put my feelings out there for the world to see Monster now lives on the internet. 
I decided I was going to tell my side of my story through a total of six episodes. Now there's a problem, problem I have with 95% of people making a web series today. Now I, I appreciate their creativity. Uh, however, it seems like the web series has become a quote unquote fallback genre for people who aren't getting the work that they really want to do, especially people in Los Angeles, in New York City. I mean, I'm not diminishing the web series, I made one, I have one in the works, but it seems to me that because anybody can make one and get it out there, that most people are making one just to make one, just for that reason. And they're not paying attention to how storytelling works, especially episodic storytelling. Most web series I see are just like chopped up segments of like one greater piece of work instead of being a series. Each episode having its own story arc along with an overall arcing story arc for the series. It's a difficult thing. Episodic writing is difficult, but it's what makes great television and ultimately it, it's what makes a great web series. So if you plan on, on making a web series, do not shortchange your audience at all. Don't shortchange them. Take the time to actually write because it stands out, it makes, it makes a big difference. Now I brought an episode of Monster. Um, the series itself uh, was scripted, well the first, first episode, first two episodes were ad-libbed, the second ep 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 or third episode was uh, outlined. Episodes four, five, and six were completely scripted. Um, Everything that you see in the story uh, actually happened to, to an extent. Um, it's, the material itself has been embellished or diminished for dramatic purposes. Um, so this, um, we'll go ahead and play this, I guess, Brian. Uh, this this uh, episode here did not play in LA. Uh, at the time that we were accepted to LA Webfest, we only had three episodes that were released and episodes two and three played in Los Angeles. But this is the series finale of Monster. And we have to use really, really bad audio because there's no cables. Heavy shit, huh? <laughs> now, I think that's probably a little bit confused there because it looked like I was playing two separate characters. Um, they're actually the same character. Um, but there's there's two different versions of the character. Uh, one's real and one isn't. And it's more, it kind of embodies an intrinsic battle in the character than anything else. So why don't we after that let's take another like quick five and uh, we'll come back and I will talk to you guys and show you some clips from the movie that I'm working on right now, potential inertia. So Day job for you, it never happened. And 
going on. Because that's me, Declan. That's 20, 10 year olds every day for the rest of my life. It's not you. If you're not engulfed in something that you love, something you enjoy, it's a no brainer. You don't give any effort because you're not happy. And when you're not happy, you love to drink. So is this about me drinking? Where did your passion for me go? Is this about me drinking? I need you to be able to take care of me. I need you to be involved in my life as much as you have been in the past. Not when you're taking a couple minutes out from your late night epiphany searching. I wish you could be me in bed. I just... I don't know if I'm ready to be the kind of wife who has to take total care of her husband if he should fail at being. Okay, that's the first uh, first rough cut there. Uh, if you guys aren't aware, uh, Brent Register actually scored that scene for me. So that was his music playing in the background. He's helping out uh, scoring a movie. <clears throat> Because he's worried about you. 
doesn't anybody mind their own business anymore? You are my business. You're my brother. I know how you are, Declan. When you're suffering, everybody else has to take the hits, too. Everybody has to feel sorry for poor little Declan. Don't feel sorry for me. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. So you have a plan, then? This great opportunity that you had and you threw it away? For what? What, Declan? Pride? Wanting on what little you have left? Talk about pride. Little Miss Hussey. Directing for theater and directing for film, two totally different things. Directing is like going from adolescence uh, into adulthood, especially when you have an acting background. Uh, as a director, you need a much broader understanding of the script, the material, than you have to have as an actor. You shape the story and the actors play it. There's a different it's, excuse me, it's a very different ballgame when it comes to directing between mediums. For example, the stage versus film. Film, I have virtually unlimited takes to make sure that an actor gives me what I feel will best suit the story. Now on stage, actors are more in control of the story. No two performances are exactly alike. Lines can be missed, props can be misplaced, accidents happen, and you can't take that back. Film allows us to see things that we may have never gotten the chance to see or get the chance to see in real life. Even if it's just a photograph. Uh, without film, some people will never get a chance to see what the Eiffel Tower really looks like, or what the Great Pyramids look like, or what it's like to run with the bulls or climb Mount Everest. Film and television can take us all around the world without ever having to leave our house. I think the most wonderful thing about film is its preservability. A single live theater performance cannot be duplicated exactly. Hello? <laughs> Those are the ghosts, aren't they? God, I mean, this place is haunted, I'm telling you. <laughs> hey, that works. <clears throat> a single live theater performance cannot be duplicated exactly. If you miss it, it's gone forever. However, if you were to film it, you could relive that moment, that exact theatrical performance, for as long as the footage exists, especially with digital technology today. These reasons alone are why I prefer to work with motion pictures. They transport us, they capture moments we want to revisit again and again, and they transcend time itself. So my first draft of, of uh, my feature that we're shooting right now, Potential Inertia, which you just saw uh, clips of, rough cuts of, I first put pen to paper uh, on the first draft 14 years ago. Uh, it started as a 10-page exercise in a screenwriting class right here at Clarion. I was put in the back burner for a while while I lived in North Carolina, but when I went through my divorce and moved home, I again needed an outlet. So, as I always do when dealing with loss, I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote. And within a month, I had 92 pages. There's no greater feeling in the world than when you finish your first feature-length screenplay, even if it's just the first draft. And the script was me. It was totally me, through and through. Now, in 2003, while I was doing my post back work here in English at Clarion, I adapted it into a one-hour stage play for Clarion University's theater department. It was performed two nights right on this very stage almost exactly 10 years ago. A lot of the added dialogue from the stage adaptation ultimately made its way to the final screenplay which we're using to shoot today. It's one piece of work that, that I'm most proud of. And I'm proud to be actually shooting it in small town Pennsylvania too. 
Uh, so we, have, we saw the clips, obviously. Uh, our entire production is grassroots funded. It's crowdfunded. Uh, nobody's getting paid to make it, not even me. And anybody can get their name on the credits for like five bucks. So if you guys feel like being a part of the movie, you can find us online, just Google us, Google Potential Inertia. We do have an official website, which is potentialinertia.onefishfilms.com. And any little bit obviously helps us finish our film, uh, which will ultimately be your film too. Now, the rise of digital technology has put amazing tools in the hands of not just the studios and the Hollywood elite. You can now shoot in great quality high def for a couple hundred bucks. Consumers and amateur filmmakers can get their hands on great tools and editing software like never before. I think the most important lesson I've learned since leaving Clarion and embarked on the rest of my life is that you don't need permission to create something. You don't need permission. Too many times in our lives we wait for people to tell us that it's okay to do something. We look too much for guidance, too much for acceptance, and instead of looking for that permission outside of ourselves, we should be looking for that permission from within. What we decide to do with our passions in life is not anyone else's decision to make. It's our decision. And if you're passionate about something, anything, there's merit. It's worth the risk to jump and go do it. I mean, for all I know, I may be making the worst film in the history of cinema, but at least I'm doing it. I didn't ask permission. I gave myself permission. I'm so in love with the process, and, and, and especially with the like-minded people that I'm working with making it. Um, so, in closing, please encourage artists to find their story while finding your own. If you are passionate about something, pursue it because there is honor in the fact that you are passionate about it. And you don't need permission from anybody but yourself. So hi, I'm Matt. Uh, I want to thank Brent again and thank the university uh, for asking me to come talk to you guys. And uh, special thanks to my mom, who's sitting right over there, and my dad, who's up there somewhere, and my son back one. So thank you guys for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it.